Thank you. Um, so thank you so much to the organizers um, for the invitation to speak here. I'm so happy to be here. It's my first time in Denmark, and I have so enjoyed um, uh, being able to be here in general and also here specifically to be able to speak about um, text mining here after lunch to, um, uh, to be able to talk about um, the process of text mining and how it fits into what we've been talking about more generally today about um, what um, are where have we been um, over the past couple of decades? Um, what do people want to do now with R, and, and where are we headed? So thank you so much for that introduction. Yeah, my, my name is Julia Silgi, and um, you can find me at this username on uh, Twitter, which I also love, as some other people have mentioned here today, and on GitHub. And you can find me here on my... Um, uh, my, my website. So um, for about, uh, I think, three or four weeks, something like that, yeah, I've been um, at our studio um, uh, working there uh, as a, my official title now is software engineer, uh, and I'm working on open source tools for machine learning and modeling. But previous to that, and to the very recent past, I was a data scientist at uh, Stack Overflow. And I was there for a couple years, and previous to that, I was a, um, uh, a data, I worked in consulting for a data science consulting firm. And one thing that I experienced in these different paths that is um, that I have in common with many R users, and probably with many of you all who sit in this room, is that I often experienced that I needed to analyze text when I worked at Stack Overflow. Um, I, you know, I was I was working for a web company where people came in and typed text into our website, and I wanted to, well, I wanted to be able to understand something about that. And for many of us, many R users today, whether whether we work at um, whether we work in healthcare or we work in finance or we work in tech, um, whether uh, we are often dealing with large amounts of text that is being generated by some process, by um, you know, by from survey responses or social media data, or um, by some business process or uh, some other process in our organization is generating this large amount of text data. And that, that unstructured text data has in it information that is, um, that can be used to make better decisions. We can use it to learn something about our, um, uh, our, our clients, patients, customers, or the, the different stakeholders that our organizations have. At the same time, if you look around at who, who is using R today, um, most people don't come from um, <coughs> computational linguistics type backgrounds. Um, that, that's actually true of me as well. My background is in um, physics and astrophysics. Most of the people who are boots on the ground, data analysts, data scientists, people doing the statistical work that they want to do with R, the people who are tasked with actually like, here, here's this, te you know, this text, I want you to analyze it and tell me what to do with it. Most people don't have um, the formal text analysis training. And so um, we, we're in this situation with this tension, and this is this is a this is a challenging situation for um, uh, that 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 we are in here. And so what I want to make the case for the case that I want to make. So a big takeaway that I want to uh, you all to leave with ideally here today is that using um, tidy data principles for text analysis and uh, focusing on count-based methods, methods that uh, largely rely on um, <clears throat> uh, statistic, on count-based statistics for text analysis, make text mining um, tasks that we need to do um, easier and more effective. And what I mean by easier in this case is that they are more directly related to um, concepts from uh, relational algebra and thus um, well supported by, um, by infrastructures that exist and are well studied and well supported in uh, various R ecosystems and um, uh, also well, well um, uh, communicated and studied throughout uh, data analysis, data science, statistical um, communities within, um, within the, R, the R ecosystem. 
So this work that I'm going to be talking about today is largely uh, sort of the sort of base of it is this tidy text package. So the tidy text package is a um, the goal of it is to provide functions and supporting data sets to act as a bridge between say this unstructured text data that you have that somehow you've read into R and um, the tidyverse. Um, ecosystem of packages. So if you are interested in using ggplot2 for uh, visualization, if you would like to use dplyr for summarization, if you would like to use um, broom for modeling, or if you would like to use the maturing tidy models um, ecosystem for um, uh, machine learning and modeling, what tidy text is bringing is the ability to use that whole set of um, of uh, <clears throat> a supported, um, cohesive uh, set of tooling for dealing with data from uh, the from data munging through the modeling task uh, for text. So that's the goal that we have here with Tidy Text. So uh, if you're interested, I'm going to talk today about like why, how, what are we doing? But if you're interested in getting started with this, um, uh, I have written a book with my collaborator, um, Dave. The book is available in its entirety online at um, tidytextmining.com. So that would be is a great place to get started both from uh, like what are the concepts, like conceptually what do you need to know to get started with text mining, and then also um, uh, what are some practical uh, examples, what are some practical steps that you need to get started. So in this, um, when I was thinking about like what do I want, what do I want to say, we're all here kind of thinking about where has R been, or where is R today, where, where are we going, and as I thought about how do I want to organize this, this talk, I, uh, and in the, especially if we take sort of case study of people who want to um, or need to analyze text. Um, I decided I want to um, organize my talk um, uh, kind of focusing on three <clears throat> kinds of tasks. The first one is um, exploratory data analysis for text. Um, we, we as analysts, as um, people doing statistics as data scientists, uh, often this is the first thing we have to do. We're, we, are, we are given some uh, data set or we are, have some uh, question posed and uh, this data set hopefully is, we are like, hey, what, what can we answer with this question, does this, can we use this data to answer this question? Or we have this data, what, what is in this data? Can we learn something from it? So we're going to start with this uh, idea, uh, exploratory data analysis for, for text. Uh, next, we're going to talk about um, what happens when we can apply um, a more sophisticated a more sophisticated level of analysis to some amount of text. So if we're still in the exploratory sort of um, uh, mode of doing, of dealing with data, but we can like uh, uh, level up the sophistication of what it is we're doing with text data. And then finally, um, uh, what, uh, uh, how can we approach uh, modeling and machine learning from text? So when, um, when I decided to, um, uh, outline my talk like this, like organize what I wanted to say like this, what I wanted to say in this way. I um, was happy to do it in this way because this is often what our users today want to do in any kind of um, domain. If we're talking about working with financial data, working with uh, time series data, any kind of data that someone has, when we talk about where where are we today, like people, if someone is interested in using R, um, what is it that they want to do? And it often is this kind of path, this kind of set of stepping stones that people, uh, the reasons why people choose an R, choose R as a language or are interested in learning R is because of this sort of step, these sort of steps that people want to go through. So let's start at the beginning here with this idea of exploratory data analysis for text. Um, uh, uh, several of the examples that we're going to be talking through here um, 
I'm going to have a text from Jane Austen, one of my very favorite authors. Um, I've got, if you would like to find me afterwards, I've got some stickers for a tiny text and for a Jane Austen. There's a, there's a package with the, the text of Jane Austen in them, so I've got both of those if you would like them. So let's just start um, with what might be the most straightforward kind of data, exploratory data analysis for text, and that is term frequencies, word counts. Um, uh, when, we ha when we start with something that feels very unstructured, it can feel like a barrier to even get to word counts or term frequencies. Using tidy data principles um, allows us to get to those fluently um, using by, by taking advantage of the uh, infrastructure that exists already when we adopt um, like, a, like a relational algebra database style thinking about the data that we have. So I'm going to show you an example of uh, an analysis that I did uh, maybe, maybe 18 months or so ago that shows you like how much impact can you have just using count-based statistics? How can we learn something that's interesting just with this sort of first level of something that we can do? So this analysis that I'm about to show you comes out of a, um, a long-standing discussion that um, that I had with my with my husband for years. For years, we'd be you know somewhere listening to music. Maybe we're in, maybe we're in the, at home or in the car, and the radio is on or something. And one of us says to the other of us, "Gosh, doesn't it seem like there's a lot of songs that are about um, California?" And then maybe the other one says, "Like, well, yes, but a lot of people live in California, um, but, but maybe more musicians." do than average, you know, and so we have this conversation, and, uh, uh, you know, a little while ago, I realized, oh, you know what, I have um, access to data that allows me to get at this question. So the first data set that I have access to is lyrics to pop songs. So I can take this, this large data set that someone has compiled of the, the Billboard year-end top 100, so what are the most popular um, pop songs on the Billboard charts, and uh, I have this access to the lyrics of them. And I can use tidy data principles to find um, all, all the words that are used in them and then identify which of those words are the names of, U United, of the states in the U.S. And then I can use ggplot2 to make a map. So this map is made with ggplot2. And I can, I can count them. I can say which ones are used more and less. So we can say, ah. Oh, Yes, California is mentioned a lot, and um, uh, New York is meant. These, of course, are mentions of New York City, not New York. Um, and I can see, like, oh yes, what's going on here? I also have access to um, uh, how many people live in all these place in all of these states uh, through the United States Census, and I can divide. And so then I can say, you know, I, I so far I'm, I'm using the very very sophisticated statistical methods of counting and dividing, right? But the but the um, the results that I get here, I'm able to um, I'm, I'm able to oh like oh yes, I'm able to understand something about the relative impact of different states. Uh, different regions within the United States on pop, pop culture. We can see that, oh, like the Deep South uh, is a region that has a lot of impact on pop culture relative to how many people live there. States like Montana are sung about a lot, even though actually no one lives there. It's very empty. <laughs> um, Hawaii, people love to sing about, you know, even though it's very, very few people live there. So this is an example. The reason I show this as an example is to emphasize that, um, uh, word frequencies, count-based frequencies, is something that can get us um, can get us so far in terms of what what is uh, what is going on in a text data set. The next thing that I want to show as, as a as an example of this is um, uh, from my my previous my previous job. So uh, Stack Overflow every year puts on a large survey, surveying visitors, users, and asks these um, users many questions, many of which are structured, multiple choice, ranking, those types of things. Some of those questions are free text, though, and this is a survey that gets um, over the past years. 60, 70, 90,000 respondents. This is a, like a big, a pretty big survey. Um, uh, like what, how are we going to process that 
those many free text responses. Like, that's a lot to read. So this is, um, this is an example of when we want to use text mining. So I'm going to go um, uh, over, so this is a, just a screenshot, but I'm going to go over here. Do, do, do. Here. Uh, so here it is uh, um, in interactive form. So this is a, so I took the text from a, a question that we asked was um, what what are what is the best thing about using Stack Overflow? What's the worst thing about using Stack Overflow? Uh, what is the most exciting and most annoying thing? So if we go over here to the positive things first, so I did the analysis of. Um, uh, the the text using R and tidy you know tidy text tidy data principles and then I made a D three visualization here. So this um, so what are what are, you know what are those the best thing about using Stack Overflow? You, know, you you get quick programming knowledge. It's easy to find information and solutions. The content and it's free. And we see similar words over here. It's exciting to learn and to the ability to solve problems and so forth. And um, if we go over to the negative side, what's the most annoying thing? Um, the rules, um, people, uh, the points, um, uh, without, the, without a reason, people downvote without a reason, um, uh, and so forth. And if we go over here to the worst part of using Stack Overflow, harsh language, um, uh, the, uh, again, the rules, uh, the, the repu rules around reputation. Um, we see some people talking about newcomers and newbies. And we would want to dig deeper to understand if people were talking about whether the newbies were the source of the problem or we see people being harsh towards newcomers, right? But uh, what we're able to see is very quickly, instead of having to read tens of thousands of responses, we're able to understand what are the themes that people are talking about here. So this is word counts. Word counts with some uh, judicious use of like stock word removal, of using removing words that are not meaningful in this in this situation. So so what so this is another example of we have we just are going to use word counts and understand what are people talking about somewhere <clears throat> all right so let's hit play again okay so this is just the most basic a level of word counts. If we want to um, increase our sophistication slightly, we can go to a um, uh, a different statistic that we can use for measuring counts, for measuring count-based data. So if we take term frequency, which is just what we've been talking about, and we multiply it by this thing called inverse document frequency, we get something called TF-IDF, which you may have heard about if you've you know, if you've been around text analysis. So what inverse document frequency is, is it, it's, it's this thing. So it's the natural log of the number of documents in some uh, pile uh, divided by the number of documents that contain some word. So let's say we have a bunch of survey responses, like we just talked about, and they all contain the word the. And then that ratio is one, and the natural log of one is zero, and so that IDF gets weighted down. If you, let's say we have a whole bunch of survey responses and only one of them contains some word, um, then that ratio is big and the natural law is a, is a number bigger than zero and it's weighted higher. So if you take TF and you multiply it by IDF, you get this TF-IDF thing. And so what it is is that it's a heuristic statistic, meaning it doesn't have any reason why it should work, but it works. And um, it uh, is used for finding words that are distinctive in a um, document in a collection of documents. So that's what TF-IDF does. So it um, so uh, let's so let's go to Jane Austen. So this is what the distribution of term frequency looks like in pretty much any well-behaved collection of documents. Um, it is, uh, if you if we plotted it on the um, log scale uh, on the x-axis, it would be close to a power law. Um, it, it has, it's so special, it has a special name called a zip, Zip's Law, Z-I-P-F, Zip's Law. So this is the distribution of um, term frequency. And if uh, we said like, oh, there's, there's a lot of words that are used only a few times, and then uh, a few words that are used a ton of times, but those would be dominated by these not very interesting words, words like A in English, words like A of, to, the. So instead, if we find what are the highest TF-IDF words in Jane Austen's novels, that's these words. 
So in Pride and Prejudice, it's Darcy, Bennett, Bingley, Elizabeth Wickham. In um, Persuasion, it's Elliot, Wentworth, Walter Russell, um, Uppercross. So if you, if you know these works, you know, you recognize the names, these names. If you don't care at all about Jane Austen, you're not a fan, you can still tell these are proper nouns. These are the names of the people and the places. So what we've done here, uh, what we've shown is that um, Jane Austen's novels are similar to each other from one to the other. And what is most distinctive about one of them compared to the other ones is that is the names of the people and places. And that's exactly what TFIDF does. TFIDF identifies what is most distinctive about a um, about a document compared to other documents. So it's another example of this kind of count-based statistic that can be used in exploratory data analysis to say, what is going on in this text data set that I have? It's computationally fast. Um, it lends itself well to quick iteration, uh, to, to filtering, to joining, to making visualizations. It can be part of this effective toolkit. <laughs> Um, I'm here. Yeah, here's another example. In the interest of time, I'll skip that one and go talking about what if we go from this this sort of first level of exploratory data analysis, where if you if you were paying attention, you probably maybe some of you thought all we've been talking about so far is single words. If we want to um, say, hey, I've got this data. I would like to learn a little more from this text data set that I have by being a little more, just a, just, a, just a smidge more sophisticated about how I look at the relationships between words. Um, and when we deal with language, um, it, it's not actually just you know a bag of words. It's not actually just uh, single words that are all thrown together. How words are used together matters. The um, order of words matters. Um, uh, uh, when, how, how, the, uh, the, how the larger text structures hold um, more and more information. <clears throat> so if we are able to do these exploratory analyses, taking that into account, we're able to learn a lot more. For example, it allows us to do network analysis of text. So this is uh, another example from the Stack Overflow developer survey this past year, uh, about one year ago. So this is a this was a free text question where we asked respondents um, that year um, if you could change one thing about Stack Overflow, what would it be? And so um, uh, we had, you know, this this was a year where there were something like ninety thousand respondents on the survey, and so uh, uh, not not all of them answered the free text question, but you know, we had we had um, many thousands of, uh, of responses here. Like, what what are we going to do with all of those responses? One thing we can do is we can do this kind of uh, text mining to understand what are the important themes. So we see a big cluster around questions and answers. People would like to change that there are outdated answers. Um, that people would like to understand that a change that um, how they find make it easier to find the answers. People would like to change the process around um, closing of duplicate and off-topic questions. Um, there's a there's a different cluster up at the top where people want to change the uh, or have have a different experience around upvoting, downvoting, um, the reputation system. Uh, there's challenges, frustrations around uh, low quality questions and answers that our our people have. Uh, have bad experiences around. Um, there are uh, people who want to talk about the opinion about opinion based content on Stack Overflow, and some people think there it should have it, and some people think um, there should not be there. Um, then there are people who talk about uh, a toxic community on Stack Overflow. So these are all things that people have responded with, and by making by using. Um, by looking at uh, words that are used together within the same answer, uh, this is a this is a co-occurrence. Um, this is a network plot that shows the co-occurrence of words that are used together. Uh, we can we can get a handle on what are the most what are the most important themes. What what do people care about when they come to this? This uh, approach of using network analysis for. Um, <clears throat> 
for uh, large text data sets that we have, I have to, we have to start somewhere with them is one that has been very fruitful. Uh, here's another example from two years before. So this was a year that on the Stack Overflow survey, uh, the, the, one of the questions was, um, was about uh, fictional representations of people who code. And so there was a question, um, what's the most realistic um, fictional representation of people, of someone who codes? What's the least, you know, the least uh, realistic and, and so forth? So, so this was a, something people could just type in whatever they wanted. And I, like, we as people analyzing the data, like, oh gosh, what, what have people typed into this empty text box, right? Like, what? I, I have no preconceived notion. So I can use this kind of text, uh, this kind of text analysis to begin to uh, do this kind of iterative text um, uh, exploratory process to begin to understand what's there. So here this year, um, um, th that is a year that Mr. Robot was very big. We see, you know, the folks from Silicon Valley, um, the classics, office space, still hanging in there, which is, which is great. You know, and so I can use this as a first step to get to eventually what was a finished product, which is this, where I say, okay, for each of the versions of the question, most and least realistic, um, annoying, and then I think the last one was inspiring. Inspiring was the last one. And then for um, these, what percent of people responded with each of these different kinds of characters. So with the, the first thing I showed you was a was a was um, an exploratory plot that then allowed me to set up rules, regular expressions, all those kind of things to end up with a plot like this where I'm able to report who, um, uh, who, who how many people uh, reported different kinds of fictional characters there. This isn't the only way in which we can um, take advantage of this, this higher level information once we go to words that are used together. Um, we can also uh, just maybe go back to bigrams. So bigrams are sets of two words. This is an analysis I did back with, back with my friend Jane Austen. And so I found all the bigrams in uh, the published works of Jane Austen. Find all the bigrams and then identify the ones that has as the first word he or she. And then look at the second word in the bigram. And then ask the question, what words are more likely to come after he and what words are more likely to come after she? This allows us to understand um, how, how does Jane Austen portray um, uh, her characters of, um, of different gender? Um, how, like, how does she portray like, what's going on with the characters who are women and the characters who are men? So the characters who are women are portrayed as doing things like remembering, reading, feeling, resolved, longing. These are all things that are to do with um, uh, like the internal thoughts and feelings. And if you look at what happens, what do we see the men doing? This is things like stop, take, reply, come, marry. These are all, these are all external actions that we see men doing. So we can see, even from this, from this plot that's based on um, uh, uh, this kind of tidy analysis of, um, <coughs> of, uh, of, of bigrams, we can see it, 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 it jumps out at us how central the internal lives of women uh, are to Jane Austen in her writing. So this is, uh, I was able to extend this analysis in um, collaboration with the data visualization experts at The Pudding. So The Pudding is a, 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 um, a website, they do um, data essays, or is what they, or visual essays is what they call them. And so I collaborated with um, Russell and Amber and uh, Hannah, and so they have a data set of, of film scripts. And what I did was um, I took the scripts and I stripped out all the dialogue. And if you take a film script and you take out the dialogue, what's left is the set direction. And so that's the part of the film script that tells the actors how to act, what to do. It's like the part that tells them like where to go and what to do. And I, I did a similar analysis where I said, what in these film scripts, what, um, what kind of verbs and you know, other words are more likely to come after he and what are more likely to come after she? 
And we see, uh, and then, uh, so I did the analysis and then these um, amazing interactive data visualization folks built the, um, built the beautiful data visualization that you'll see if you want to look it up. And so here's part of the thing, the, in the finished product. So uh, the words that are more likely to come after she are words like snuggles, giggles, squeals, sobs, gasps skips, shudders, um, and words, then there's words in the middle that are um, uh, about equally likely to come after women, uh, or after he and she. So this is works like walks, pushes, um, sends, finishes. These are somewhat word neutral words. And then there are the words that are more likely to come after he. And this is words like, um, like rams, shoots, uh, zooms, uh, cries. So what we, what we can see here, what we, we can learn something about these, um, uh, these stories from pop culture that we absorb um, when we watch movies by doing this kind of analysis of scripts. And, and this is, um, again, we haven't, we, I guess we're doing statistics at this point, right? Because we're, we're doing uh, um, uh, the, the, the um, what's most likely to come after one versus the other, but we're still using count-based methods, uh, using, um, <clears throat> these tidy data principles to do this kind of data analysis, and we're able to learn something quite interesting here. All right, so um, <coughs> uh, in this last section, I want to talk about moving from uh, this more exploratory uh, regime of analysis into uh, machine learning and modeling. And I want to talk about um, an example of unsupervised machine learning for text and then finish up with an example of supervised machine learning for text. So one of the, probably probably the um, most well-studied and appropriate kind of um, unsupervised machine learning for text is called topic modeling. And the, me the mental model for this is that you have a pile of documents and you're going to, um, you're going to build a model that is going to assume that um, each document in your pile, is, you're going to model it as a mixture of topics and then each topic you're going to model as a mixture of words. And you get out, so because of that, you get out two sets of probabilities. You get out the set of probabilities that um, a, a word is generated from a topic, and you get out a set of probabilities that a uh, document is generated from a, and a topic is generated from a document. So to give you just kind of an idea of how the kind of output you might get or how this might work, here's the example from like a little toy example, or the output from a little toy example, where you, um, Let's say we took these four books, and let's say we shredded them up, we broke them up into pieces, and then we trained a topic model that tried to put them back together, and how successful would we be? And this is showing you the output, that, um, that this unsupervised machine learning model was quite successful at putting uh, back together, say, Pride and Prejudice, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. It was somewhat less successful, I mean, still pretty good, right, but it was, it was relatively less successful at putting great expectations um, back together. So this is, this is, um, this is how, so these, this is gamma, which is the, um, the per document per um, topic probabilities here. So this is one of the sets of probabilities that we get. Um, let me show you an example of the other sets of probabilities, uh, just to give you an idea of the kind of thing that you can learn here and the kind of thing that, um, can be useful in, even very useful in real life applications. So this is a less contrived example. This is, um, don't freak out if you can't read these words, I'll read some of them off here for you. So this is, uh, this is like a million um, uh, comments on Hacker News and then uh, training a more realistic topic model on them. And so you end up with a, a quite a number of, um, of topics at the end, and then the first couple are dominated by sets of words that are fairly general purpose. You know, it's words like people don't think how even just didn't. So these are words that like you can imagine people who are commenting on the internet using, they're, they're just sort of, sort of general purpose um, words that people are using a lot in their comments. But then if you go down uh, uh, quite a bit, you're going to get to um, words like, like in topic 20, we have a topic that is about money, market, value, buy, price, 
And then if we go a little bit further down, we get topic seven. That's about software experience, project build, working um, team. And then uh, topic 19 is like important design, computer, human, future, research, science. So the, what, the, what has happened is the topic model has taken all this unstructured data, all this unstructured text data, and then has learned which of the... Um, which of the uh, um, uh, comments are being generated by the same the same to the same topics that we believe that the model believes like go together go together in this way? Um, if you're so this is this is how unsupervised uh, modeling for text can work. So if we want to even go a bit further up, we have text that's not labeled, but I want to use a more rigorous method to understand what goes together in this way. You, um, if you're interested in getting started with this, I've got a blog post and a tutorial on YouTube and whatnot. The great thing about this kind of modeling is we can use more rigorous methods for understanding when did our model do a good job, when can we be worried about, no, my model did not do a good job, and understand like how, many, how, how will I know um, how many topics to choose to go into my model. So these are all things that um, this kind of approach can really um, do a great job of understanding. And then here, at the end, let's talk about um, just one more example of, like, as we walk through, what is it, if we've got text data and we want to do something with it, like, just to, let's talk about one more example. If we want to be able to do um, uh, text classification, we want to do predictive modeling with text. And here, um, I'm going to show you a, just a quick example. Um, and so take the mental model of, we've got Pride and Prejudice, and we've got War of the Worlds, and imagine that we, we shredded both books and we mixed them up and then we, we can train a model that will be able to take one of the shreds and say which book it came from. So we've got some kind of labeled data that can, that can learn from a little bit of text what, what it's from. So um, I'm very excited about this piece because in my, in my new role at our studio, I'm working um, full time now on, uh, in my day job on tools for making this process um, uh, um, uh, easier to get started in, uh, easier to ha uh, e easier to um, be committed to good practices to encourage good statistical practice. Um, so here's just like maybe if you were just just at the beginning of your process, you would write code like this that would. Um, that would uh, uh, you know, split your data into training and testing data. For text, uh, the kind of models that tend to work best are, can be different sometimes than other domains. Um, one, actually one kind of model that works great for text is, um, is lasso regression. And here, um, uh, here's the output of that exact model I just described um, for lasso regression. And if you, have, if you have another takeaway that you want to take from this, um, this talk here, maybe it's this one, that a document mentioning Martians is unlikely to be written by Jane Austen. <laughs> so that, that can be your other big takeaway from this talk. But what, we, what I'm plotting here is on the logistic scale, um, <clears throat> how big are the, uh, are the coefficients that push either the probability towards uh, Jane Austen did write this or Jane Austen did not write this. And so one great thing I love about using, um, about using tidy data principles with modeling and machine learning is that um, the tools for interrogating your model are very um, uh, transparent. And so like um, uh, also these tools for getting out um, the kind of model metrics that we want to be able to see, like say, like an ROC curve or an area under the curve. Uh, here's, a, here's the ROC curve for the model that I just, that I just showed. Um, okay, so um, like the, some of the other folks who have been up here, I'm going to just finish up by talking about, like in the, in the near term, like what am I really excited about for where R is and where R is headed. The first one, um, from the perspective of the kind of work that I do, the first one is um, working uh, with for um, understanding better the decisions about building features for uh, modeling and machine learning for text and how that impacts models. So we do things like, often, um, we'll do things like... Um, Removing stop words, stemming, um, maybe maybe building word embeddings. Like you have the super sparse 
um, space of, uh, of single words, and you can you can uh, create a non-sparse, this dense representation using embeddings that you learn from some, uh, you know, like some other big data set. These all impact the models that we have at the end, and um, it is uh, a lot of these things are often default choices in modeling workflows, and it is not very well understood or um, discussed how that will impact where you end up at the end. So this is something I'm really excited about digging into deeper and sharing how, how what will what will this do? How how will this impact the model that you have? The next one is um, talking broadly about fairness. Um, uh, uh, an algorithmic uh, bias in analysis of text. Almost like any big, any big text data set that you're going to come across has latent within it um, uh, systemic, historic uh, biases from society. And when we train models, um, when we train models on those data sets, uh, it gets it gets built into the models that we train. So this is something that we need to know, we need to understand, and we need to know like how is it going to impact the outcome of what it is that we're going to do. So this is something else that I um, am excited about for the uh, the opportunity to be able to have discussions and understand where is this, where are we headed with the kind of uh, modeling and machine learning we're doing with text. And then um, I am uh, really uh, enthusiastic about the current work that is happening um, in the R ecosystem that I'm personally doing and that people in the uh, text ecosystem in R are more generally are doing to build um, uh, user-centered uh, um, modeling functions, machine, machine learning functions to, um, to, to, uh, to set us up for um, being a community, like a community of practice that um, adopts good, good statistical methods, good machine learning methods. And so with that, I will say um, uh, thank you very much. few questions up there. Do you take into account possible typo? Ah, so ty so misspellings and typos in um, text analysis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so when I've analyzed survey data, um, or, or you know, you, depending on the kind of data that you have, data cleaning is a really big issue. Um, there are some. Uh, so there, if you have. Um, if any typo is common enough, a machine learning method like topic modeling will learn to put it together with what it belongs to. And there's actually um, there's actually some some work that shows that like uh, that's related to the stemming work that um, uh, it's not it's not worth it to try to correct. Just like if it if it happened often enough it's going to just get put into the same bucket, right? Like the same topic or the same, um, uh, like if there's signal enough there probably for you to like see it and um, correct for it, that the these, these, for example, an unsupervised machine learning method will learn that, oh, it belongs with this version of it. If you are interested in finding most common misspellings, um, there are packages for string distance. There's also packages for, um, uh, that are more dictionary based, uh, like lookup type thing. So um, data cleaning when it comes to user generated, like data that is generated by like people in the real world, like that, like that's, that's, right. you know, like there we are, right? On that. There was a question also towards the back. Yeah. Okay, so I had a question about when you were discussing those surveys, especially with Stack Overflow. So I would imagine, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but for example, if you ask people to just list words, like just for example, list the first 10 words that come to your mind, for example, when you think of the best things or worst things about Stack Overflow, <coughs> I would think that that's kind of more fair to the respondents that they don't spend time like traveling on, like, because I also saw in the network that there were things like another one. So I feel like I would imagine that just asking people to list things would also take less space to store and would be kind of easier to analyze and make the graphs of networks. So in your opinion, what is the advantage of 
having this open responses where people like actually express themselves and write them, if not really <laughs> Yeah. Okay. So, so people do actually read them um, because when we use, uh, so often um, in the research, like in the teams I have been involved in, um, at at several at in several orgs, um, the. Uh, quantitative research has, researchers are, are like work in partnership with qualitative researchers. And so it's not a matter of no one reads them ever. It's a matter of, um, you know, like, okay, let's start with a text mining approach. And then once we have a text mining approach um, and we have an understanding of the biggest themes, then we can, um, you know, randomly sample um, people who mentioned some list of words and then we can uh, read them and code them. And then qualitative researchers can code them. Um, and then, then people will actually reach out for inter user interviews, you know, and understand. So it's not that the, um, it's not that it's not useful to have that. It's that, um, uh, and that it's not, it's certainly not anywhere I have been involved that it is not read. So I apologize if I miscommunicated that slightly, that it is not read, but rather that um, there are multiple steps and um, uh, sampling is used in different ways in quantitative and qualitative research. Um, uh, we certainly, certainly that could be approached is like to ask people to list things. Um, uh, I, I've dealt with quite a number of different like um, data sets where you ask people just to type stuff in and um, uh, I, I, it's my opinion that like bringing as low a uh, set of expectations to that as possible is best like like um, you know if you're gonna give me a box of people that people on the internet can just type stuff into like it's it's best to just be like well let's bring as flexible a data analysis approach to that as possible because bringing high expectations that people did what you told them to do um, <laughs> is you're gonna be like met with such disappointment and sadness and yeah. I think we'll okay we have many we'll take two more questions Hannah promised that it's okay to take a little bit of that time <laughs> so um, in the middle there? You. Yeah, you. you. Yeah. Um, so tiny text, I think it's a very, um, it's very nice. I've looked at it a little bit. I'm very curious about NLP type uh, data analysis projects because they are very insightful. Um, I'm sure a lot of people come to you and tell you, oh, um, tiny text enabled me to do one analysis or one huge thing that I was trying to combine. Like one of the most interesting things I heard, I heard about NLP was was a project at Microsoft where they took all the commit messages for some software and joined that stuff together with the bug reports made by the engineers and users and all of that. Can you tell me? If, can you tell us if anyone has told you, "Oh, Tidy Text facilitated us doing a thing that you didn't expect them to be able to do"? Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's see. <clears throat> so one. Um, uh, off the top of my head, the thing that's that's easiest to remember is something I've done myself. Um, so, uh, and I, I, when I started working on this, I was like, I just don't know if there's going to be the signal for this, and we're going to be able to do it. But so this was one of the. Um, uh, again, this is from like the previous job that I most recently left. Um, so there's there was one of the ways Stack Overflow makes money is through the um, the jobs product. I don't know if you've ever noticed like there's jobs advertised in like the sidebar and one of the things that um, uh, there's interest from from the people who like the clients who pay money for the so for the things in the sidebar is um, uh, like can we tell a difference between um, people who are uh, um, more junior and people who are more um, uh, more senior and I would like to advertise to more senior people of course always uh, um, so um, so we were able to use some uh, text data that we had from people who had like filled out certain parts of their profiles um, to build a model to be able to to be able to have like pr pretty good like pretty good results results that the clients were fairly happy with to be able to um, uh, be able to detect that kind of a difference, like people who are more senior versus less senior on Stack Overflow. So that's one example that comes to mind off the, off the top of my head. 
All right. I All think right. We have to break here. Yeah, we have uh, be, be a chance to talk to, to Julia in a moment yeah. after the next talk with a piece of birthday cake in your hand. Yeah. Um, thank you.